We're going to call this meeting to order. Somebody want to hit the gavel one more time. Thank you. Welcome. If you all could please stand for the invocation. Please bow your head. Lord, we thank you for one more day. We thank you for waking us this morning and starting us on our way. Thank you for traveling grace and mercy throughout the rest of the day and the week and the coming days. Father, we thank you for the leadership of this college, this city, this nation, and this state. We ask blessings, special blessings, upon our students, families, friends, all of which who are affected by Hurricane Irma. We ask that you bless them, keep them, guide them, give them the necessary things that they need um, to move forward. <coughs> we ask that you bless this meeting, the board members, and the leadership, along with every St. Petersburg College employee. All these blessings I ask in your son Jesus' name, in whom I pray, and in whom name you may pray. Amen. Amen. <coughs> Pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, We're going to start this morning with recognitions, and first we have a presentation of retirement resolutions um, and motion for adoption. I'd like to invite up Lynn Chinquette. Resolution. Whereas Lynn Kinket, is it Chinket? Mm -hmm. Chinket began her career as a staff assistant in the associate provost's office on the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus of St. Petersburg College, January 2003. In May, she was promoted to senior staff assistant. And whereas Lynn became the senior staff assistant in the counseling disability services in 2009. In 2015, she became the full-time administrative assistance to accessibility services. And whereas Lynn has streamlined the accessibility services processes and created an effective and efficient electronic accommodation intake process, she has worked well at perfecting and becoming proficient with the new accessibility information management system. And whereas Lynn is known to her students and colleagues as a dedicated and extremely knowledgeable administrative assistant. And whereas Lynn has provided outstanding support for the Mac J. Williams Award and the Johnny Ruth Clark Ceremony for over 10 years. Whereas Lynn has a warm and generous spirit, and we wish her happiness in her retirement as she returns home to Maine to spend time with her family and loved ones. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the St. Petersburg College Board of Trustees and the college community hereby recognize and appreciate the outstanding contributions to the college and to the community by Lynn Chinchette, Chinquette, and extend to her our best wishes for enjoyment throughout the years ahead. Said resolution being adopted and approved by the Board of Trustees, St. Petersburg College, this 19th day of September, 2017. Miss Chinquette. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, I am going home to be with my family, but this is my Florida family. <laughs> Love you all, and I will miss you. Thank you. Thank you, Lynn, and congratulations again. Just one quick announcement this morning. Uh, we did not uh, have the opportunity to have an interpreter here. However, uh, the meeting online will be closed captioned. Uh, so those that need it will have that uh, as quickly as possible once this is posted. 
Uh, now I'll invite up uh, Dr. Furlong and Mr. Lang and Ms. New for a Florida College System Foundation presentation. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members Good of the morning. board, and Dr. Williams. I'm so pleased this morning to introduce two familiar faces, Dr. Tom Furlong and Mr. Joe Lang. Both have been longtime members of the college, Florida College System Foundation Board of Directors, and every year the St. Petersburg College Foundation receives a gift for them, uh, from them. Since 1999, we have received over $550,000 and now for this year's check presentation and the details of this year's gift, I introduce Dr. Tom Furlong and Mr. Joe Lang. Thank you. Tom. Thank you. This is, uh, this is Mr. Joe Lang. Was, uh, uh, I'm going to mention a couple of statistics, but this has given over a million dollars, this foundation, out of the system. And I think you might have been the uh, um, first board member on the foundation board when it was created. First or second? First or second, yeah. So Joe's, Joe's been doing this for a while. I'm, I've been doing it about 10 years, I think, now. Uh, so the Florida. Great to be here today. The Florida College System Foundation has given over a million in scholarship funds to the 28 colleges. Uh, they're primarily aimed at relieving the nursing shortage and helping students who are the first in their family to attend college. Uh, I heard an interesting fact from the chancellor the other day that I didn't realize, but some of the smaller colleges, a lot of the smaller colleges, this is about 40 to 50 percent of their foundation. It's not the case here in a bigger city like, like we have, but it's, it's, it's still a nice gift to the, to the local uh, college. This year, we're giving uh, the Nursing and Allied Health Scholarships from Florida Blue are $15,380. First Generation Scholarships, $34,000 from Helios, and $5,000 from Bank of America at a total of $54,000. Florida Blue has been gr a great donor for us. Nursing or Allied Health students receive these since 2006. Last year, 829 students statewide received these grants, 20 at this college. The uh, Helios, a uh, more recent donor, has been awarded since 2007. Last year there were 442 first generation students, 10 from St. Pete, and our total so far from Helios has been over $250,000. And finally, the Dream Maker Scholarship Award is uh, we get as benefit from uh, Bank of America. Scholarships are for first generation and college students. They've been awarded since 2001, and St. Pete has received 48,000 in scholarships since its inception. I'd like to uh, uh, I'm proud to do this on behalf of the board, and I also just a very sad thing you may have read in the paper, but one of our board members, a longtime board member, Brian Bewalda, managed to uh, help clean up his neighbor's yard, which is so typical of him after the storm, and stepped in a puddle, and he's not with us anymore. So it was really a shock. We got the call about coming here, and at the same time we heard about that. So Joe's known him longer than I have. So uh, he did a lot for the system. So I just want to recognize Brian. So thank you very much. We'll move on to comments now, uh, and I will uh, kick this off. I just wanted to give a huge thanks again to the staff at each campus of St. Pete College, the faculty, mm -hmm. the administrators, for everyone who was here to help make the decisions and then prep the campuses uh, for what could have been um, a much more serious Hurricane Irma for us. I know many people were affected, um, some more than others, however, um, St. Petersburg College act quickly, uh, decisively. There was a plan in place of what to do um, and student uh, protecting the students and making sure they were safe was first and foremost. I know Dr. Williams will we'll go a little bit more into this later, but I just wanted to, to thank everyone for the extra time that they spent on that uh, and for what that means to, uh, to the college here. I also want to thank the uh, 
collegiate high school students that so graciously uh, showed us where to go this morning and opened doors for us and uh, showed great hospitality. Um, and of course, the whole Gibbs campus for opening their doors to us today. Any comments from uh, other board members? I'd just like to say, Mr. Chairman, that uh, during the storm, um, the college was um, a, uh, a place where um, police officers, first responders, and also uh, a lot of the power companies were housed. And just uh, thank you, Dr. Williams, for being there for the community and, and, uh, and stepping up and uh, making sure that we were all uh, had people to be able to come out and respond to the storm appropriately. And I think that uh, it was a, the college was a, a beacon of light in time of, uh, uh, of the situation. And I uh, say a special prayer for my friend, Ms. Bello. They had a, a lot more damage than most of us. And uh, we're praying for you. And if you need anything, don't hesitate. Any other comments? President Williams. I could not be more proud of our team. We work together. We had meetings at 10 a.m. every day and 4 p.m. every afternoon as a team through this storm. And each and every one of you should be commended for your involvement, your input, and your active and quick participation. Because of what you have done, I believe that you've made the college family feel more calm during the storm and folks felt like they could take care of what needed to be done. I want to um, say a special thanks to our facilities and our security team mm -hmm. who worked every day um, to clean out refrigerators and <laughs> all kinds of things to get us back online. Trustee Gibbons, thank you for your involvement on the power issue um, and getting that done. But um, if I start naming names, I'm gonna miss people. So I'm gonna say thank you, everyone. Um, we have had a lot of accolades sent our way because of our involvement. We even had one of our staff stay overnight at EOC during the storm um, and um, was there to hear up-to-date information so we could get that out to the college family. Our faculty are strong and ready with the continuity plan. They're working on ways to make sure that our students still gain those essential competencies and meet the um, outcomes that we have planned for um, su success. So I'm real happy um, we talked about the impact to Florida here, the storm. They're thinking it's close to 80 million bucks. So there's a lot of work to do here in Florida billion. to get billion. billion, sorry, to get people back online. Pinellas County was definitely blessed we dodged a bullet. Real happy about that. The other thing I want to say is we received the outcome of our Florida equity report and we were commended on the work that we have done to help um, students succeed from various backgrounds, socioeconomic statuses, and ethnicity. So real happy about that in the report that we received back from the state. And then I learned this morning from Dr. Gordon that on Saturday, the uh, Palladium held a play on Web City or something like that, and they netted $20,000. So people wanted to have some fun, and they bought tickets and they showed up and I just want to recognize the team for that. So SBC is up and running and we're ready to roll. So thank you trustees for your support and um, trust in, in my leadership team and the decisions that were made on behalf of students and employees. Thank you. Thank you. I do not have any public comment cards uh, on my desk here. So we will move to the review and approval of the August 15th board meeting minutes. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? I move. Second. Any comments, questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That passes. We'll move now to the monthly reports with our board attorney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Board members, you have before you a proposed resolution for the board. The history of this is that Diane or Luann Eagle Ferguson, the daughter of Dick Eagle, who many of you may know or may have known, he's passed away, drew the will that's attached to this proposed resolution. Luann is probating it for the estate. 
and she called me because she has a concern. The will you'll find in Article 5th provides very graciously, I think, for a gift to the District Board of Trustees. Uh, it will be a significant amount to start out with in cash, and then there's one or two properties that will be sold, and, and that will even increase it from that point on. What this will pretended to do at that time was to establish a scholarship for uh, Mr. Mr. Frosch, who was a faculty member here at one time, and <clears throat> he wished to have a, a scholarship set up for at least four people from the income, from the investment of the uh, amount of the gift they're going to give, to provide those four scholarships in his name and uh, do that in perpetuity. It appears that the economics are such that there will be enough that that can be afforded. And so to go forward, which is your normal procedure, this is a matter that would be handled by the foundation, actually. And so what this resolution does is accept with gratitude, the, the board accepting with gratitude the gift that you're taking, which is the, the uh, residual uh, bequest that's in the will, and then <clears throat> directing that it the funds be turned over to the foundation for administration. And, and this is one of the things that he asked for in his will, that the board approve or set the uh, criteria for this scholarship. And so the way the, the re, uh, resolution reads is that the board will make the board of the foundation will make a recommendation to the DOT of uh, what criteria should be established for this. And so it'll come back to you for you all to approve that. And uh, your immediate approval of the devise will allow the attorney, Luann, to go forward and work on the closing of her estate. Move approval of the resolution, Second. Any questions or comments from the board? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Aye. So passed. Anything from our general counsel today? Good morning. I don't have a report this morning. Thank you. That will move us to uh, student success and academic achievements. Um, we're going to talk about online classroom experience with Dr. Kolarik with a presentation. Good morning, Mr. Good morning. Chair. Members of the board and Dr. Williams. I'm Susan Kolarik, Associate Vice President for Online Learning and Services. I'd like to take this opportunity to provide some information about our online students. I'd like to begin by highlighting some of our partnering departments. Students find us in a number of ways, through our website, digital media placements, or word of mouth. Requests for information come in from across the country, and pre-admissions works with those prospective students, getting them through the application process. Online advisors then work with students outside the immediate Four County area, as well as those who indicate they're interested in completely online programs. The same services that are provided to students on campus are done through chats, phone calls, emails, even webinars called Titan Thursdays, where students can connect online for information. 10 academic and career advisors served almost 14,000 students last year in 30,000 visits. The result, students like Emily, who are able to pursue their academics while continuing with their family and work obligations, wherever they may be located. We have a growing national presence, although 97% of our students are within the state of Florida. And the majority of those are within our four county region. Two thirds of our students take at least one online class and 34% take only online classes, with most being part-time students over the age of 26 and primarily female. Only 10% of our first time in college students are exclusively online, 
And this is by design. We want this number low so that we encourage students who are able to come to campus to begin that way before moving online. First time in college students completely online also tend to be part time and are more likely to be female and are pursuing associate's degrees. William is actually typical of our older students who have a career but come back to school to keep pace with the changing industry and move on to a more fulfilling career. Last year he was awarded the Online Student of the Year Award by the Instructional Technology Council, an international organization which held its conference in Pinellas in February. After a decline in 2015, online enrollment has increased to our highest levels in both headcount and student semester hours. And online students often tell us how important the classes are as they balance life and education. Three years ago, we started a process to revitalize our online courses with the instructional design team working with faculty to develop a standard course, a sort of template to teach from. We continue to make progress with the standard courses and have completed 94 in that three year period, which represents more than 50% of the online enrollment. Success rates in those courses continue to increase through the continuous improvement process and withdrawals and student complaints are decreasing. We also continue to increase our support of online students and campus students needing assistance online. The Student Readiness Instrument provides feedback and resources to students as they begin their college experience, as well as providing information to faculty on the skill levels of their students in their classes. Use of the Spark tool, which provides easy access to great information to faculty, as well as text and email outreach to the students who need it, continues to increase. And the Learning Support Centers have increased the number of online workshops, which are beginning to take off. Two sessions were held via web conferencing recently to help students develop effective study skills. 80% of the participants had never attended an LRC workshop before. So we're reaching a new audience with this method. Students who complete an associate's degree with us often continue back with a bachelor's degree. In right of light of recent events, I included some information on the role online plays in our instructional continuity plan. My courses is a cloud-based software housed outside of Florida and had uptime the entire time. So we were able to use it as an additional communication tool. Now assignments missed during the closure can now be made up online, whether the students are on campus or online. And I'd like to conclude with some accolades that we've earned. Online colleges rank St. Petersburg College number one out of 112 Florida peer institutions for best online college. The college received a 99.61% overall rating based on affordability, student services, and availability of online programs. The U.S. National Center for Education Statistics ranks St. Petersburg College number 38 nationally for the number of students taking exclusively online courses SPC is one of only two public Florida institutions in the top 50. And we continue to track and support other rankings as well to see what potential students are seeing. SPC will be featured in an upcoming report from Intentional Futures Consulting called High Tech, High Touch, which was commissioned by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. We spent two days with a representative back in June to highlight the work that we are doing here and the early draft really shows the innovative and supportive work that we are accomplishing. And next month, we will receive a national award from Quality Matters, QM's Making a Difference Award for students, for the work that we have done for faculty support, course development, and student support. Are there any questions? Thank you, Madam Chair. Dr. Kalaris, thank you for your report. Can you talk to me about the success rate as it relates to um, online courses? Sure. Online courses are in con continuing to close the gap between face-to-face -face classes and online classes with about a 3% differential right now in success rates. We do break that down by course, so each semester we analyze it for each course, and each course is broken down by age, uh, ethnic background, uh, and first time in college, so that the faculty members can continue to increase the, those success rates. 
Overall, it's about a 3% difference between online and face-to-face, -face, uh, if you look at all the courses overall. Um, racial breakdown, again, looks at about the same rate um, across the board. There are some groups that we still need to work on, but the difference between the face-to-face -face and the online courses tends to be fairly consistent across the groups. So amongst STEM courses like science, technology, uh, math, Math courses are actually have increased about a 10% rate over what they were pre-revitalization. So we're very pleased with those. We don't have very many science courses online, uh, but those are also coming on board right now and we'll be analyzing those. So the math courses, what do they look like in relation? Is it still a 3%? Uh, it's actually been a little bit higher. Some of the first ones that we did, 1033 and I forget some of the numbers. Um, but those actually increased 12% um, from pre well, I mean, revitalization. In relation to face to face classes, what did the success rate look like in a math course online as opposed to a face to face? I don't have that number off the top of my head, but I can get that for you. All right. and, then um, we, and CCIT courses are actually um, tend to be more successful online, but there are more of them online as well. So the, the ENCs are those courses about the same or 3% different? ENC online has not been as successful as we like, and we, uh, Dr. Uh, Mr. Leopold has worked with the faculty to increase that and make changes, um, but we are increasing the rates on that. Okay. Can you, can you give me the, the, the data on that? And then the yes. other thing is, uh, do we have, because we've been talking about online for a while, do we have an instructional course that uh, before you take an online course, you have to take that course to be able to take an online course? We have a course that all students are recommended to take, um, and most faculty in the gen ed courses incorporated into their syllabus as required. Um, so the students will hit that in a number of different places. The reason we require it for all students is because all classes use my courses. Um, so we wanna make sure that, that the things that they need are built into all of the courses. So the answer is no, we don't have a required course before you go into an online course. You have to take an instructional course about our Correct. particular. Correct, we do not have a required right. course. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wright. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chairman, um, what is the ratio of faculty who teach only in the classroom versus online? Do they split their time or are online teachers exclusively online? Uh, it actually varies by program. Some faculty choose to be completely online. Mm -hmm. um, others are in programs that are primarily online, so they will have more of their hours in that area. Um, it is a faculty member's choice. If a faculty member chooses not to teach online, they are not required to and have classroom assignments instead. Um, so it is a faculty choice in that issue. And what is our advertising for online courses? I happen knowing Last night watching TV, there was an advertisement for Penn State University online classes, and I knew we were having this discussion today, and it surprised me to see Penn State advertising here. I was curious what we do from an advertising standpoint. Uh, it is interesting. We do a lot with the um, digital marketing, which is a very sophisticated system that I couldn't even begin to explain. Um, I'll leave that to the marketing department. Um, but it, as students search, for online programs, and particularly programs that we have, they will begin to see SBC ads um, in their work. Uh, we do place billboards around the county because most of our students are still primarily here. Um, and we're gonna begin an outreach program for word of mouth. So students who are outside of our general area, we have a plan to send them SPC memorabilia, um, a Titan's uh, magnet for their car so that we can begin to get that word of mouth and that name recognition outside of our region. Yeah. I think um, Dr. Polaris, you may want to talk about the state of Florida's agreement now that we can go outside of Florida as they're working on that to advertise um, outside. You know what I'm talking about? Sure, the uh, state authorization reciprocity agreement. Yes. Um, it is in process. Mm -hmm. The governor did sign the uh, order and the state board has been working on that. We actually had a meeting scheduled for next week to lay out the terms that we will need to meet. Um, that meeting has been canceled because of the hurricane issues, um, but we'll be holding a series of them online. 
Um, in the meantime, I'm working with Ms. Garner and we are getting all of the materials in place um, so that the minute we are allowed to uh, authorize, we will file the, that paperwork. There'll be a lot of reporting that will need to be done to accompany that. Okay. Um, but that will allow us to actually reach outside the state of Florida. At this point, we have students outside of the state of Florida. Whether or not we are technically supposed to um, it has been a little bit up in the air since June 30th when the other agreement ended. Any other questions? Thank you, Dr. Thank Clark. You. Next, we have a SACS on-site visit update with Dr. Crawford, Dr. Haber, and Ms. Roberson. Good morning, Chairman Stonecipher, BOT members, and President Williams. I am Heather Roberson with the Center of Excellence in Teaching and Learning, and I'm here with my colleagues this morning, Dr. Jennifer Haber, Dr. Sabrina Crawford, to give you all a uh, final update before our SACS COC on-site visit. And we're about 19 days out, so not that we're counting or anything. Um, and uh, we've got some additional details that we would like to share with you about the visit. So we've got some schedule specifics. We would also like to extend a special invitation for our BOT members for uh, Wednesday, October 11th for a lunch that our on-site committee from SACS would like to uh, meet with our president and also a few of our BOT members. So we'll share some information about that. And then we're also gonna go through a very quick training to refresh you one more time about our quality enhancement plan. So I'll turn it over to Dr. Crawford. Well, good morning. Good morning. It's good morning. almost impossible to believe that after two and a half years of board updates, this is our final update before they arrive on October 8th. And we're excited to be here today. This is kind of just a quick review for you to share the most important, important parts of this, their schedule that pertain to when you might want to be there or make your schedules available, as well as give you the final update on our QEP, just as a reminder. So we ha currently only have a tentative schedule from our SACS team. We got a little bit delayed uh, due to the hurricane, but we have four areas where you might want to participate within that schedule. Our team is going to arrive on Sunday the 8th. The first three members will arrive. They will be spending the afternoon of Monday visiting our first two campuses, the Allstate campus and Midtown campus. Tuesday morning, they go back out and they see the Vet Tech Center and they see St. Pete Gibbs. That afternoon is when the real things begin. They're going to come, remember when they come, they have actually two parts that they need to do. First of all, they need to review the QEP, the Quality Enhancement Plan. This is the first time that anyone will actually review the Quality Enhancement Plan. So the vast majority of their time will be focused on that. But they do also need to come and check on the 10 standards that they had questions on, as well as the other 18 standards that are required by the feds. Um, so during their, the very first thing that they'll be doing on Tuesday afternoon is they'll be meeting with Dr. Williams. Uh, we'll be meeting in our boardroom at EPI, and she'll be giving an overview of the college, a brief overview, and then a question and answer period. It would be wonderful if any of you have the time to appear for that. We'll have a time schedule by early next week to be able to share out with you so that you can put these things on your schedule. Right now, it's tentative for about 1 o'clock. Um, after that, we'll be doing the introduction to the quality enhancement plan. Again, if you're able to come for that or stay for that, that would be wonderful. And they spend the rest of that afternoon and the, almost the entire day on Wednesday conducting interviews that we don't know what of yet. They'll give us that schedule later on. At the end of the day on Wednesday, they do a, a final report out um, just to Dr. Williams. And on Thursday morning, they share all of those findings with the college community. Again, that'll be held at the Epi Boardroom. That would be a wonderful event for you to be able to attend as well to hear all of the findings. Um, so there is the luncheon on Wednesday that Heather mentioned. Uh, we certainly hope that you'd be willing to come to that. And if anyone has questions or would like further prep work or would like to talk to me one-on-one, -on -one, I'm happy to have any type of conversation with you about those things. So we're looking forward to it. It's three weeks away, and it's just been a lot of hard work from the entire college community. We want to thank you for your support. All right, so your last QEP update. Um, so I am the faculty lead for the QEP. We are excited, uh, as Sabrina and Heather mentioned, a couple weeks away. Um, I have equipped you with some very important information today. So one, you will see our document here, our report. We're very proud of all the work that we have done. This has been a truly collaborative effort. 
Um, so I want to share that with you. And if you get some time, you may want to look through that. That has all the details of what we've done from our data on how we got to our topic to um, information about our population. And I will review a few of those things with you today. Um, of course, you have our card. Things you should know about the QEP. We've told faculty, staff, students that they can wear this in their pocket if they want to, or they can carry it with them because these are things that they may need to know as our SACS people come to the campuses and walk around and talk to everyone. Um, and after today, you get to wear your bracelet and your pin. That means that you are SACS ready. You can see in our audience that we have a lot of SACS ready people here. And so you too, after today, will be SACS ready. Um, so just a couple of things that you should know. Um, so first of all, our topic is college. See, you're already SACS ready. Look at that. <laughs> um, just a couple of things that you should know. Um, first of all, our topic is college readiness. Um, you've, you've known along the way how we got to that topic. It's important for our students. Really what we want to give them is strategies for success. The strategies that we have come up with are motivation and ownership, time management, knowledge monitoring, which gets them to know what they know and they don't know to give them some study skills, as well as comprehension. So we feel that our students can benefit from these strategies. The way that we have done that is through a course. So we call our group the Neighborhoods for Success. The course is actually NFS 1000. Our students will be placed in that course starting in the fall semester and they will go through that course through the spring semester. Our course was actually supposed to start last week, but as you know, we were not here, so our course will actually start next week. Um, we have a pilot for right now, so we're actually in year zero, which is kind of a funny thing, but we're in year zero this year. It's our pilot year, so we are piloting on two campuses. That is the Clearwater campus and the Gibbs campus, um, and then starting next year, we will add additional campuses. So we wanted to start with that pilot and then add from there. So next year is actually our year one. Our population for this pilot and for our plan is our flexible opt-out students. Um, this was decided because we were supposed to look at the students who had the greatest area of need from our data, from everything that we found. We determined that our flexible opt-out students, those students who, are, who were recommended to take developmental classes but chose not to, were the students who were in the greatest area of need. So those this will be the students that we'll be looking at. We're very excited. Um, we've done a lot of hard work. We, are, we can, will continue to go through the plan over the next couple of years, and you will have many updates for this, but I really appreciate your support and everyone's hard work. So, any questions? Any questions from the board? Thank you all for your hard work. I know uh, you have been up here many, many times over the past couple of years giving us updates, and I think what's most impressive is the amount of groups that you've met with, people you've talked to, workshops you've put together, being able to, to combine all of these thoughts and ideas into a uh, plan going forward is impressive and we're grateful. Thank you very much. Thank you. That brings us to budget and finance and with our monthly financial report, uh, I'd like to invite up Ms. Jeanette Hunt and then Mr. Brian Miles. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Board Trustees, morning. Dr. Williams. This morning is the first report of the fiscal year 17-18. And so I'm gonna take a little time explaining uh, some of the uh, slides here this morning. They're gonna be a little bit different than what you saw last fiscal year. Uh, first, I wanted to just remind you, the year over year change that you see highlighted in yellow, that is the prior year to date budget to actual percentage compared to the current year. One of the factors to remember in this percentage is that our current budget is $10 million less than it was last fiscal year. So that's about 7% less, and that was realigned based on the enrollment trend. So we see here that our student tuition and fees, this includes lab fees, access, our learning support access fees, also our technology fee, our budget at 61.2 million, and then we had an actual at the end of August at 27 million, with that year over year change at a positive 4%. <laughs> so next we see the state funding. Our state funding, this includes our Florida College System appropriation, our lottery performance funding, and also our industry certifications. This is about 50% of our budget. This fiscal year, we budgeted 71 point, about 71.8 million, 
Right now we're at 9.5 million. Next we have our other revenues. Those, that budget is at 5.6 million. This includes our use of facilities, rentals, uh, our indirect costs from grants, our um, interest and dividend payments, and also some miscellaneous revenues. This is about 4% of our budget. We also have our fund transfers in from our auxiliary fund, which is about 3% of our budget. And also I wanted to point out in our reserves at $1.8 million, Last fiscal year, we were $4.2 million, which is about 3% of our budget, which is now this fiscal year, 1% of our budget. The total revenue for uh, through August 31st was a little under 37 million. The next chart I wanted to show you and keep in front of you is our projection of our tuition revenue. So we knew that we had budgeted la uh, this fiscal year to be down 3.5%. At the time of this report, we were about 2.4% down, which is a 1.1% above the targeted budget amount. That equated to 239,000. So this is tracking that trend. The red line is the budgeted amount and the blue line is the projected tuition amount. Next, we'll look at our expenses. Our last year uh, budget for our personnel and benefits was 118 million. You see this year it's $5 million less than last fiscal year. Our actual at 16.6 .6 million with a year to date percentage of 14.7 million. So if we took the personnel and looked at it, basically the equal payments of personnel, we knew we'd be around 17%. So we're a little bit lower than where we um, targeted. Our current expense, last fiscal year, our budget was 32 million. This year we're at 28 million with an actual 4.2 million. And we spent about a million dollars less this fiscal year at this time of the fiscal year than we did last fiscal year. Our capital, we're at 574,000. For a total balance of our revenue over expense at 15.5 million. So this chart I added because we wanted to look at what our average prior year spending was compared to our current year spending, just to get a perspective of where we are and what we've historically done. And if you look at the blue line, the blue lines show the average of the prior year spend. The green line shows where we are at this point in the fiscal year. So you see in our personnel, we were uh, in the average of 14.7 and we're currently now at 14.7. In our current expenses, we were in the previous years 17.2% spent, and right now we're at 14.9%. In the capital, same thing, in the prior year we were 23.1% spent, and currently now at 20.7% spent. And then total overall, we were at 16.9%, and at the end of August, we're at 14.8%. And just to give you a um, comparison of what that means in dollars, that's about $2 million. Any questions on the budget report? Hi, Jill. Yes. I'm confused. Um, back to the first slide, you said enrollment was down 2.5%, but student tuition and fees is up 4%. I'm just curious how. Right. So. The, the year over year change, because one, the budget at the time of last fiscal year was about 5.6 million when it, we actually came in at about 5 million, that weighs into the factor as well. The other point with the three point, we were budgeting 3.5 million to be down, we actually were only down 2.4. So we're actually 1.1% over the amount that we were expected to. The reason the 4% looks a little odd, it's because of the ratio compared to the actual budget last year to the actual budget this year. Does okay. that explain your question? Sort of. <laughs> <laughs> as long as you understand it, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? So the next portion of the presentation will be the update on the phase two of our budget review and you will be hearing from some key leaders that are leading those reviews. Thank you. Thanks. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Dr. Williams, members of the board. 
uh, just a point of clarification, Jeanette inadvertently said we budgeted down 3.5 million. We actually budgeted down 3.5% on our enrollment for the year, but we're down 2.4%. So we're a little bit above projection. Still like to see that at least be flat, but uh, just a point of clarification there. Uh, good morning. This morning I'll be briefing you on our budget realignment process. As you'll recall, this past spring we came before you and recommended that we realign our budget for the new fiscal year based on what we were seeing with our enrollment. And we recommended that we do the budget realignment process in three phases. Phase one was through June 30th of last fiscal year, and our goal there was to cut about six million in expense. And we achieved that goal. We actually cut about 6.2 million. Phase two was to uh, last for the first six months of this fiscal year, and that's the portion I'll be speaking to you on today, and others will be joining me in that discussion. And then phase three is to last the entire fiscal year. Phase three consists of reviewing our overall footprint at the college, increasing international student enrollment, and then also revising our faculty workload. Jumping to phase two components, these are the items we said we would take on to review in phase two during the first six months of this fiscal year, and these are the items we'll be discussing with you today. I'll give you a moment to review those. The first one is reviewing college structure and reallocating resources across various divisions and departments college-wide. All the vice presidents are working with their departments and their staffs to take this on. We're looking at the structure top to bottom we are reviewing internal procedures and uh, not only board rules and procedures, but also informal procedures that have developed over time. And we're asking ourselves, are these procedures still good? Are they up to date? And do we need to make changes in these areas to increase efficiencies and reduce costs? We're also looking at automating manual processes. What we're finding as we conduct these reviews is we have more people than necessary touching s uh, certain processes and it's costing us extra man and woman hours college-wide, which increases expense if you were to assign an hourly rate to each, uh, each individual's time. We're looking at uh, how we can eliminate duplicative activities college-wide. We're also looking at our meeting effectiveness across the institution. Many of us find ourselves in meetings that have same or similar agenda items, and we're having to rehash the same issues. So we're looking how we can recapture our personnel's time by eliminating the number of meetings and just making our meetings more efficient across the institution. And finally, we're looking at how we want to realign our organizational structure. Uh, we are finding that some of our positions uh, have uh, changed over the course of time. They have evolved. In some cases, some of uh, the duties assigned to those positions are outdated and need to be updated. And so we're looking college-wide at how we can realign our structure, update positions. From this, we will create some vacancies college-wide, and, and those will help reduce our personnel expense, assuming we don't fill all those vacancies. For the vacancies that, that do occur that we determine are necessary, we will look college-wide to see if there are personnel who could switch into those vacancies rather than bringing on external candidates who might tend to increase our personnel expense. So we will look at the reorganization of the organizational structure once we have the results of the transition team assessment. As you know, Dr. Williams has commissioned uh, within her first 90 days a transition team report, um, and that's due to be out in November, I believe, and then from there we'll take their recommendations and go to work on how we realign our organizational structure. Item number two is a review of consulting services college-wide. We have hired over the years a number of external consultants. We want to take a look at each and every one of those contracts, determine whether those consulting services are still necessary, and if they are, and if it's appropriate, renegotiate the terms of those service agreements to increase efficiency and, again, reduce costs. So we'll be taking a look at that as well. I'll be followed by Jim Wechter, who will uh, talk about uh, increasing facility rentals and partnerships. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Williams. Um, 
The first two items go hand in hand. Uh, we have, as you know, hired a consultant who specializes in space utilization, and we are working with that consultant and in conjunction with our provosts to look at our spaces college-wide, specifically those that are, as we know, some vacant, some underutilized, uh, with the intent of making better utilization of those spaces, potentially identifying parcels or spaces in the buildings that can be either leased or, or disposed of or whatever the case may be. The board obviously will have the final say on that. Um, working with the provost on that, but that's a really, really broad task. And, and the one thing that we're kind of zeroing in on is the Health Education Center. As you know, our c capital improvement plan for this year requested as a first priority the final funding for the St. Pete Gibbs uh, building next door. But second is the Health Education Center, and, and the ask there is significant. Um, we don't feel that just asking the legislature for 60 to $70 million is an appropriate plan. So we want to look at all of our options. We're working with the provost, Dr. Carver, and our space consultant to look at all the options, potentially alternative funding, potentially uh, moving some of those spaces to other locations. There are a lot of, lot of opportunities, working with our health care providers, a lot of different things that may be going on that we want to kind of zero in on with that consultant. So. As we look at our vacant spaces, um, clearly one of the driving factors is the health education program and what we're going to do with that in the, in the years moving forward. Um, we have a final draft of the facilities rentals handbook. As we identify those spaces um, that may be available for lease or short term, short, short term or long term lease to our partners, we want to uh, identify revenue opportunities to the extent that they exist and uh, work to, to generate more on the revenue side of the ledger sheet. And then finally, um, all of our long-term leases. We have over 30 long-term leases with our partners. Many of them we're kind of locked into, but where opportunities exist to uh, provide more revenue streams, um, we're certainly taking advantage of those. And even it goes as far as our building designs. You know, this building that's going up next door for which we have the groundbreaking today, um, has a space identified in it, spe not specifically, but will, will serve a great function as a lease opportunity. Revenue uh, for events, for example. The Bay Pines facility, some of you have seen, has a great opportunity for revenue generation. So we're doing that as far as it relates to building uh, designs as well. I'll turn it over to Mike Nash, who will talk about technology. Good morning, Mr. Chair, Dr. Williams, members of the board. I uh, wanted to discuss a little bit about our plan for our technology refresh program. Just to give you a brief overview, the technology refresh program specifically focuses on desktop, laptop computers that we use in classrooms and for faculty and staff. Uh, we generally lease items on a four-year cycle. Uh, we wanted to evaluate if the current iteration of that program was viable and then what changes we need to make to either make it more efficient or find some cost savings. Obviously, we need to do this without jeopardizing quality in the classroom. Um, so we wanted to look at how we can enhance technology, in, particularly in student use areas, our libraries, learning centers, and classrooms. Um, we feel that the best way to do this is to increase our vendor competition. Uh, historically, we found that we've been buying things on a habitual status rather than on an analytical status and really looking at uh, what options are out there from different vendors. Um, so we started to make some connections with some other manufacturers to see what their offerings are as well, to see what we can get better price-wise. So if we can get uh, two or three different quotes from different vendors that have comparable systems, we can find which one's the best price and which one's the most appropriate for that student use area. Uh, we also want to explore technology alternatives, particularly as it comes to virtualization. Um, VDI may be a long-term solution for us, especially in classrooms and labs. But we want to make sure we approach it the right way, make sure that the support structure is in place so that if we do move in that direction, we can properly support it and make sure that the student experience isn't going to suffer and, in fact, will be enhanced by doing that. Um, we also want to consolidate our leases. Uh, as the program has grown, we found that there are many leases where it's one or two devices, and then in the same lease cycle, we have another lease at the same location with 60 or 70 devices. So we want to make sure that all these ones and twos that we have start getting pushed together into one lease just to make the program more manageable, which will reduce the amount of labor hours that are encompassed in managing that program. And then we want to make sure that the best way to do this is to collaborate with key stakeholders to understand the use case for these devices, what's going on in that classroom, what software is being used in that classroom, how are the students interacting with the device, is it performing the way it needs to, and then also are we overspending on devices where 
we put these high-end systems in that are only using 30 or 40 percent of their capacity, if we can put something maybe less expensive that will still meet all of the needs we have, we can find some savings there as well. So those are our key focuses. Uh, initially for this fiscal year, we're looking at about a $50,000 savings, which will then reoccur for the next three years as well. So about 200,000 over the course of the next four years. And then as we evaluate in the next year, that number will start to grow. So that's our plan for now. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Cleric who will discuss student systems. Over the years, we've purchased and developed a number of systems that provide information about our students, particularly systems used by the academic advisors. The first goal of this review is to reduce or eliminate redundant, inefficient, or ineffective systems. And then the second will be to streamline the user experience to increase efficiencies for the academic advisors. Finally, we'll begin to look to reassign, realign personnel who may be supporting these systems that are outdated and will be eliminated, and we can better utilize those talents in other areas. Uh, this is a very fast-moving project uh, scheduled to be completed in December so that we can incorporate it into the next budget cycle. And with that, I'll turn it to Dr. Caraggio. Good morning. So uh, I have the last of the, of the phase two updates, and this is specifically looking at enrollment in general. And as we know, enrollment's complex. Uh, it's made up of m multiple components. Uh, here we're going to talk specifically about recruiting components, things we're making changes in the recruiting area and pre-admissions, uh, retention, how we're retaining the students, keeping them, and then how we're changing the scheduling process. Uh, and that's been a lot of, a lot of discussion here lately, uh, especially during the presidential search discussion. I know the schedule came up a lot in, in dialogue. Um, I'll start with recruiting component. Uh, as an institution, we're really evaluating how we've done recruiting in the past. Uh, we've had conversations about how we've uh, moved closer to social media and put a lot of focus and attention on that, and maybe less attention than we have in the past in terms of how we integrated and involved in the community. Uh, what we'd like to do is work going forward and retain a lot of the work that we've done in the social aspect, because I think we're one of the leaders in the state in that aspect, but I think we have to return a focus on what we're doing in the community, how we're interacting with the community and being involved. Uh, recently, uh, for the summer and for the fall, uh, the provosts have done a lot of work on their campuses and their local communities that exist surrounding those campuses and involving advisors out there. We want to look at resources in general and understand should we do any reallocation to kind of look at that recruiting model and make sure that we have appropriate resources that exist at the campuses that can directly respond to needs we have in the, in the community. Uh, second component is retention. Uh, the lead for the retention aspect will be our faculty and our faculty governance organization. Uh, they're re really gonna put a keen focus on how we improve the retention of our students. We know in general that's kind of the low hanging fruit. It's a lot less expensive to keep the students we have than it is to go out and get brand new students. So we really need to do a better job of making sure our students are successful in keeping them here in the classroom. Uh, that's closely aligned to the classroom experience, which is one of the strategic initiatives that the board brought forth for the work this year. Last one is on the scheduling. It's really a redesign of the scheduling process. Uh, we're having a, a sequence of collaborative meetings with our deans and provosts together. Uh, to work on how we do more of a campus-based scheduling model, how we focus more on what's going on specifically at the campus and build the right schedule for student needs, uh, and to look at things we've done in the past, such as the guaranteed schedule, and how we might modify and make that changes. Uh, we've had a, a meeting of a collaborative discussion that existed prior to the, the Hurricane Irma. Uh, we had a couple that were canceled as a result. Our next one's coming up this Friday, but we're really focusing on what changes we want to make for this upcoming spring schedule and getting ready for spring registration and the broader changes we're going to make as we get ready for next year. Any questions any of us can answer? I have a question relative to the transition team, so it may be a Dr. Roden question. Um, we heard that the organizational structure is being reviewed by the transition team, but many of these other phase two items perhaps will be touched by that same can you give us, I know the report's due and you're not involved specifically, so can you give us kind of big picture how much of this may fluctuate relative right. to that report? I think a lot of it will fluctuate, but because of the time, we can't sit and, and wait and not do anything, mm -hmm. especially when we're trying to impact spring enrollment and get uh, registration moving and up. But, but before we do any structural or restructuring of the organization, we will wait for the transition team report 
we will not make any of those changes prior to that unless there's a vacancy or something like that. Right. But other than that, we'll wait for the team. Thank you. Any other comments Good from job, the board? <coughs> Thank you. Thank you. This is uh, fantastic work and something, again, we've been talking about for a long t time. And I know we as a board, as we hear words like uh, competition, negotiation, analytical <laughs> assessments, eliminating <laughs> duplicative activities, um, these are all good things. And uh, what's even better is that it's in conjunction with things like retention and recruitment and increasing our potential for auxiliary income. So. Uh, I'm excited to see what the final analysis looks like, uh, but we're definitely moving in the right direction. Thank, Thank you all. Jim. Yeah. Sounds like a willing accomplice. <laughs> yes, it does. <coughs> With that, we will move on to uh, human resources and the personnel report, which the board should have in their packet um, and should have reviewed. Are there any questions or comments as it pertains to the personnel report? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. And now we'll welcome up Ms. Desiree Warner with the Employee Health Insurance Update and Brian Miles. And I've interjected myself, I apologize, <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to kind of set the stage for what Desiree is, is about to speak on. We're here today with the goal of uh, hopefully getting our proposed changes for the 2018 health insurance plan approved by this board. And it's significant that we do this today as a result of the timing of all this. Uh, we're scheduled to have open enrollment in November, and then these changes, if approved, would take effect uh, January 1, 2018. Desiree will walk you through the specific changes we're proposing. We are uh, receiving uh, information from our consultants that project our health insurance expense to increase by about a million dollars again this year. And that's a result of increased health insurance claims as well as other fees. So she will discuss with you this morning uh, proposed changes that would result in about a million dollars of savings. Uh, she'll also touch on where we are with our health insurance fund balance. We're at about 5.5 million and we need to keep that amount uh, we need to have at least 17% of our overall spend on an annual basis in our reserves, our fund balance, which is currently about 3.1 million. So we have a little room. We obviously don't want to get too close to the line. Uh, she'll go into a little bit of detail about that, but I just wanted to set the stage for you. At the next board meeting, uh, several of you asked us for information. Ms. Cole, you asked how these projections would impact our budget down the road. We are uh, working on a three-year benefit strategy that we'll bring back for you to consider at the next board meeting. This will be similar to the three-year financial plan that we discussed with you last year. Uh, we are also collecting information from other institutions to address Trustee Gibbons' uh, request for information about what other colleges are doing, how our plan compares to other colleges, and whether it would make sense to join a consortium of other colleges to provide health insurance to our employees. So we're collecting that information. We were a little bit delayed last week with the hurricane, but we'll be back in front of you at the next board meeting for you to consider those items. Desiree. Great, thank you. I'm gonna just give a recap again uh, in regards to what I presented last month from the trend of our claim spend from 2015 to 2018. Uh, again, where we are seeing that we have uh, an increase each year. Uh, in 2017, we recall that we did have cash and plan modifications that address that. And then we discussed last month that we needed to come back with recommendations uh, to address the 2018. Uh, I also wanted to include this time just a breakdown of our members of which uh, of the plans and what uh, those are made up of. So I indicated here that we have our point of service. We have 68 members. Our largest uh, membership is in our open access. We also have our high deductible plan with 417 members. I mentioned to that to you last month. And then we have 72 retirees. We did talk about the steps that we would take in order to bring the uh, plan changes to you today. And so I just wanted to highlight uh, that we did accomplish that. 
we did uh, evaluate our employee health and wellness programs. We, we took a look at what we have for the remainder of the year, what we would have going forward to make sure that those align with our high prevalent uh, diseases, which I had mentioned are high cholesterol, uh, high blood pressure, and gastritis. And so we're taking a really close look at that and redesigning those programs. Uh, we've also looked at our pharmacy benefits to see what room we have to make any additional revenue uh, capture there, and so I'll present that to you. Uh, and uh, as Mr. Miles mentioned, we looked at our safe harbor uh, fund, and uh, again, 17% around that 3.1 million and our 5.5 million in reserve that we have. Uh, just to give you an example, in the early part of 2017, we did have two catastrophic claims, uh, both exceeding $350,000, and so that can happen, and so that is why we need to make sure that we keep that reserve uh, as stable as possible. Uh, we are also, we did take time to talk with our insurance committee, and I did, uh, I want to present today what that committee is made up of. Uh, it is very diverse, it has uh, coverage across all campuses, and from every type of uh, employee, from our administrative staff and faculty. Uh, the plan uh, was presented, it was modified based on feedback from a couple of different meetings with that group, and so we felt that it was very collaborative in the uh, presentation that we're making today. And so um, uh, doing the best we can to make sure that our employees are still covered uh, and also meeting our need to um, reduce that million dollar. And then of course today we're presenting uh, for your consideration. The next slide does uh, look a little busy, but it is a makeup of our members of the insurance committee. So you can take a look at that. There are uh, 27 members. Um, again, wanted to include that, and we can go over more specific if you have questions on those. Um, Trustee Gibbons had asked what other offerings might we have for our employees besides insurance, just the basics, and so I did want to list that we have a diverse mix of offerings that we provide to our employees. Um, there are voluntary choices that would include vision, dental, accident, cancer, life insurance, hospitalization, auto, uh, disability as well. The college also covers 100% of one of the dental programs, which is considered a high level, um, I'm sorry, the, the lower level program that, would, uh, that we made modifications for last year. And then there's an up, up charge that an employee can play and pay for the, uh, the second plan. Um, at the very bottom of this, we have two plans that uh, the college covers. It's called the medical um, uh, reimbursement plan. It's $25,000 per individual per lifetime for cancer and dread disease. That will cover uh, your co-pays, your deductibles, and so that's a really nice benefit for those employees who are uh, actually uh, have some critical illnesses. Also, the college will cover vision uh, char uh, expenses up to $175 uh, every 24 months, and so that those are built into the plan. And then the college also covers free well care visits. Um, those include your your primary care visits, uh, mammograms, your, your special tests like um, colonoscopies, um, important screening uh, tests, but those are covered uh, and no charge to the employees. And so now we're gonna move into our recommendations for our plan changes. I have these uh, itemized out and then I'll have a side-by-side -side slide for you, a little bit busy, but at least you can see uh, what the actual cost would be at the end. So our first recommendation is in regards to making changes to our deductibles, our co-pays, uh, as well as our out-of-pocket maximums. Uh, right now we are looking at increasing our uh, employee-only deductible from 250 to 350. And then we have uh, also employee plus, that includes employee plus child, employee plus spouse, and then employee plus family, and moving that to one deductible of $700 uh, on an annual basis. After the deductible, the college currently pays 100%. What we're recommending at this time is that we move to a 90-10 plan, which is a 90% coverage and then 10% uh, coinsurance. Uh, and then also increasing the out-of-pocket maximum slightly, where uh, we have currently 1,500 for employee only, we would be moving that to 2,000. And then for family, we would be moving from uh, 3,000 to uh, 4,000 and that would be an annual out-of-pocket maximum. 
And then we have some changes in regards to copay for urgent care and emergency care moving from to uh, 50 and 350. And all of those changes would yield an increase in revenue of approximately 450,000. Then the next category is in regards to our salary contribution contribution tiers. Currently, we have contributions that are made based on income, and we have different tiers. They start at less than twenty-five thousand, then twenty-five to thirty-five, and they go up at this time to eighty-five thousand as a uh, cutoff for the contributions. And what we're proposing is to add an additional uh, tier at ninety-five thousand again to just um, uh, proportion out those those costs for uh, em the employees' incomes. That would yield uh, 39,000 in revenue. Okay, and then across all tiers uh, of all categories, we're looking at uh, $10 per month for employee only and then $20 per month for all other tiers. I do have a note that um, many of these changes with asterisks exclude our high deductible plan, and that is because currently our high deductible plan is uh, already exceeding in what the in employees pay. For instance, they're paying 80% insurance. Uh, I'm sorry, it's an 80-20 plan, so they have 80% coverage with 20% copay. Um, and they also have a higher deductible, um, which is $1,500 for employee only and then $3,000 for family. So at this time, we felt that it was um, good just to leave that plan as is. It's, it's still doing very well, and so that we're excluding that plan for any recommended changes, with the exception of adding the 95,000 tier. Okay, and then so we're also looking at our retirees and uh, increasing that $100 per month. We do know that there is many uh, very affordable options and uh, available for our retirees. We're going to be having some information sessions that I'll talk about, um, but we do think that increasing a, an additional $100 per month for retirees uh, is important because it is still not at the level that would, would cover the, the expense that we're seeing there. And then making some slight adjustments again to our co-pays uh, for, for our tier one, that is uh, $10 per month, and I'm sorry, $10 per prescription, or tier two would be 35, tier three uh, would be $60. And then introducing our value plus formulary. Um, what this is, is a uh, requirement for uh, employees to purchase or to get prescribed uh, alternative drugs that have the same ingredients. And that would be, for instance, it would be uh, Pepsid versus Prilosec, where you have similar or same ingredients, still brand name, but one is more expensive than the other. So we would be looking at uh, the lesser of uh, cost in that and asking uh, that the employee choose that option. Uh, the yield on that would be $181,000 in revenue. Uh, also, employees at this time are getting prescriptions that are maintenance. They usually do that 30 days at a time. We would be asking that and requiring that they would get those prescriptions 90 days at a time because it would be cost savings for the employee as well as for us because of the quantity. Um, so the total of these uh, recommended changes would uh, cover our need that we've uh, outlined for 2018 projection, uh, 1.083 million. So this is the slide that I had mentioned that is very busy, but it does have side-by-side -side our current uh, plan versus our, propose, our proposed changes and then what that difference would be in cost to the employee. Uh, for instance, with a maximum out-of-pocket from the employee only of $1,500, second line going to $2,000, it would be a difference of $500. And so if you all would just want to take a moment to look at that. Okay, so the next two slides are uh, really detailed for you to see the different types of communications that we're going to be providing as well as our employees to have an idea. Uh, starting this week, we're going to be providing information about our insurance plans. Uh, uh, we're going to be doing basically a campaign that's going to be email, campus postings, blue and white articles. We're going to do face-to-face. -face. And then we're also going to be doing personalized letters to our employees with, uh, if you have this plan, 
uh, as a single person, if you didn't make any changes, what would that look like? And so uh, at the time of open enrollment and at the time that we uh, do visit the employees, they'll have information that's pertinent to them that they can ask questions about. And then, as Mr. Miles had mentioned, we're going to be bringing back to you in October um, more detailed information. And we actually have um, a lot of um, drilled down information that you'll be able to study in advance of the, of the meeting. Uh, specifically, we've put together a three-year benefit strategy. Um, we've also, we have gone out to the other colleges and we've gotten the information about what they charge for employee, employee only, their deductibles, if they have uh, health reimbursement, accounts versus high deductible plans, all of that we're putting into spreadsheets for you. Um, we've looked at the seed funding that we're doing for our first year of uh, individuals who do join our high deductible plan. Um, last year, that was around $84,000. Um, we're also gonna be looking at early spring, every uh, bid on all of our programs uh, from A to Z. Uh, including our broker, because we feel that we've had a really good relationship with our broker. Uh, however, um, we want to make sure that, that they're being competitive on our behalf, as, um, as well as Aetna, who we've had a long-term relationship with. We just want to make sure that uh, we're in the best position as possible. So we'll be looking at that. We've also looked at what do we have in voluntary offerings and where might we be able to add more for our employees. Uh, we've identified a, a, a couple of those. For instance, long-term care is one of them. Um, some uh, legal shield, pet insurance, and those kinds of things. And so we'll bring that information back as well. So at this time, I am uh, available to, to, an to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you. Um, thank you for a very good report. Um, my question is, who are the companies that we provide the um, so that we have other offerings for our employees that they're able to opt into the billing cost of college and say, what companies are they? All right, I'm just gonna slide back to that. Uh, okay, so for our vision, we have Advanica. Uh, we have Aetna, who covers our dental. Allstate insurance is our accident and cancer, as well as hospital. We have Hartford for our life insurance. Liberty Mutual for auto, Lincoln Financial for short and long-term disability, and then our own uh, plan covers the medical reimbursement plan for cancer dread and for the vision. So I guess my next question will be, if it's voluntary, why wouldn't we have as broad a field and, and people could choose whoever they want to? What's the, what's the drawback as long as, they're, as long as we've investigated them and made sure they're not taking advantage of our employees? Why wouldn't we open it up to all kinds of people? And I'm just throwing this out right. like Aflac and all these other companies. Why, what would be the drawback? From so there? we've looked at a couple of different companies. They want to be the broker of choice. For instance, Prudential has approached us and they've said if we take that plan, they wouldn't want us to have another plan. And so they would be looking at the economy of scale and how, the, how they would be able to offer to the employees services and be guaranteed a certain number of members. Um, however, that is consideration of right now because we do have these plans, what can, what can we do to expand that and have people work with us? Part of that would perhaps be the consortium, uh, which we have uh, reached out to them to see what plan offerings they have. Um, and we uh, have started that preliminary conversation with them. But most of it does come I down to I'm membership. I'm asking that question because if you just say no, you can't be the broker of choice that you could offer to employees. What's the, you know, who would turn down having the option? That mean that would create, for example, Hartford, right? Their competitor also had not. That would be the best opportunity mm -hmm. for them to market and give our employees the best possible plan going right. forward. But without any competition, then they could offer whatever. There's no reason for them to be, to incentivize their program or to help our employees. So as far as being a provider and having a group plan, what happens is pre-existing conditions sometimes come into that. And so the carriers will say, um, if, if you're coming in, you can join our plan without a, a physical um, because we're your group plan. And they've, they are our specific uh, vendor of choice. 
Uh, however, we'll take that feedback and see what we can do to, to broaden yeah, because that. Because even if you switch plan, you know that going into it. Mm -hmm. I mean, if, as long as it's already written out there and you say, well, you know, this pre-existing condition we won't take, then the employee can make that decision. But without any competition, it, we, you, you don't have any bargaining power to make sure that each one of the employees, especially if it's a voluntary plan. That's the thing. Mm -hmm. it's, I understand where you're going when you say we have our provider. I get that. And we're looking at the system-wide thing. But the voluntary plan, you should have as many of those as possible to make sure the employee feels like they're getting the best bang for their buck. They should be able to decide that on their own and without any competition. If this is all you got, then this is all they have the opportunity to do. But there may be someone whose spouse has something else at their company and say they like that and they want to have that here. But without any competition, mm -hmm. you don't give the employee the option of having any options, to be honest with you. So um, I would look at making sure that we, you know, if it's voluntary, you know, give them the, as many options as possible. Okay, we'll take that feedback and see what we can do to enhance it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yes, I had a question about our average claims in the total. Are those, you mentioned the two catastrophic claims, which obviously are outliers. Our general claims in the monies that we pay, well visits, general sick visits, or I'm, I'm just curious if you analyze it to um, that detail. So we have, uh, we've had an increase also in our high dollar claims, which are those claims that exceed 50,000. Right. So we've had an uptick in that as well. And we looked at that, it had to do mostly with heart conditions and patient care. Right. Uh, <laughs> and so we're, we're able to look at that level of information um, generally, um, our well visits are not going to be our higher spend. It is going to be those conditions that are uh, what we consider high dollar claims, where they're going to require more specialized medicine, more specialized care, and it's going to take a longer time uh, for the employee to recover. Thank you. Yeah, and that's part of some of the information. Again, we do have, um, I shared with um, Dr. Williams just uh, a couple weeks ago, th the actual book of details of that. Um, and it is c complex, but it does have that level of drill down in information. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, do they have to be like on this page that is really busy that compares the difference between 17 and 18? Do you have to do all of those together or can they be picked apart? I'm bothered by the emergency care increase. I think $200 would, I mean, in some people's cases, keep them from taking a child to the hospital with 104 degree fever or something. I mean, can that one be modified and everything else be left the same or are they like a package deal? Uh, no, we can still modify the, the recommendations. Um, the insurance committee did um, have that question as well and we looked at what are the, um, what's the spend that's making that up and um, a majority of the spend was uh, uh, instances where they could have gone to convenient care to, um, to the lower cost. And so um, we had a breakdown of what the diagnosis were and, and the cost of those visits. And so when we, we looked at that again, it made sense for us to increase that to encourage the use of, um, of our convenient clinics. Can I piggyback on that for a second? Sure. It, it, would marketing not help make people go to a convenient care clinic or if market mm -hmm. look better and then to, communications to our employees of where to go mm -hmm. as opposed to the ER. And then secondly, to our point, could we have maybe a sliding scale? Because our employees, what's the average salary? It's probably not that high. Right. And this could end up you know, being 10, 10, well, maybe 5% of someone's salary um, to go to the ER. So if there's maybe a sliding scale for those employees that make within this bracket that is down in the higher employees, you know, could maybe be a little higher, but I'm, I'm with you on that, Ms. Bell. That's, that's a good idea. And let's look at, let us look at this, um, that recommendation and sure. we'll bring that back. Um, we definitely need to start looking and move on the plan so that we can meet the timeline, um, but we could definitely go back and look at the emergency room piece, especially the communications piece. I do not believe that um, we regularly educate the employees of better options than, than to wait and go to the emergency room or go somewhere else. So we'll bring that back when we come back in October. I agree, Dr. Williams. 
I'd also tell you that any person that um, we, we have a big, we have 2,000 employees in our own company, and the way that we get cost down is through competition. When you make people compete for your customer, they find a way to get the cost down, because guess what? The employees are going to be better served, and it's going to cost, they want those employees on their medical plan. And, and uh, the 2,000 employees that we have, we have probably 10 or 15 providers that can volunteer that they're able to go and look at. And trust me, every year they come back with something new because they don't want to lose what they have, they don't want to lose any ground, and they want to gain more. So I'm telling you, the way to a little bit to, to, to help your costs go down in terms of insurance is make them compete. Thank you. Follow-up question along with the emergency room versus the urgent care, convenient care. Do we have a convenient care provider on any campus? No. Just ever here? So, no. Um, City of Clearwater, I know years ago in their analysis, they introduced a on-campus, for lack of a better word, provider who was there once a week, twice a week, who handled both well visits and sick visits for the city insured population and depending that's why I was asking what the breakdown but it goes also to encouraging people in the education part of when they should go to see a primary care physician as opposed to go to the ER I don't know if any of our partners in the community would be willing to provide an on-site nurse on so that would be part of our strategy that would be right. we'd be looking at uh, the other thing in our communication plan is that we do have the, uh, the the nurse call where you can call and give your symptoms and employees haven't been utilizing that so we're putting all of that in and trying to educate the employees on what tools are available for them including the urgent care information and but we have looked at uh, if there's any type of on-site clinics that we could also partner with I know we've looked at that for students as well well, and that could even address their facilities. I mean, yeah. somebody would pay us to lose that space to be the on-campus provider, yeah. potentially. Well, thanks for your feedback. We'll look at the competition piece. I think it's very important. And going out with an RFP will, will help us address that. We'll also look at uh, the ER care that was mentioned in, in your concern, Trustee Cole. I did want to let you know that as part of our HR revitalization effort, which is currently underway and has been underway for months, one of the changes we've already made is hiring somebody to focus specifically and only on benefits. We had somebody that worked with benefits before, but he also did a lot of other things, and he was very good at what he did, but we feel that by uh, having a person specialize on benefits only, it will help us keep our eyes on these concerns going forward, and so I just wanted to note that change for you. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, a critical piece. There's there's so many moving parts to this. Um, yeah. It will be helpful to have somebody on it full time. Uh, the only comment I have, uh, you know, I know we had a similar conversation last year as it came to making small changes in the plan to kind of get in line with, with budgetary concerns and where we're at. Is the three-year strategy that will be presented with next month going to um, look at ways that perhaps we can make more permanent changes so that every year we don't have to come back and make small cuts um, or small changes to the plan? Or is a lot of that out of our control based upon uh, factors that, that have nothing to do with St. Petersburg College? Well, we would look at what we have as far as our stop loss levels. Uh, we'd also look at when we lock in, if we look, when we go out to bid, we may be able to lock in a, a three-year mm -hmm. uh, plan, which is what we had before, and we've been doing really year by year at this point. And so that would be part of our um, strategy. Okay. Yes, uh, the answer is yes. It will be, uh, we'll look at this from a budgetary standpoint because what a lot of what we're doing now is reactionary we don't want to be in right. that mode uh, this whole uh, last year and and very much so this year is about hitting the reset button uh, get realigning everything so we have a more proactive approach and the health insurance piece because it does constitute a big part of our budget we will take that same approach one of the the items that has concerned me over time is uh, the projections that we receive I want to make sure those are as accurate as possible 
And that's part of the reason we're going back out to market in the spring. We want to make sure that we have the very best projections that align with our budgetary projections to make sure we're not in reactionary mode each and every year. So yes, we, we will plan for that. We are working on that. We'll be back in front of you with that. Perfect. And then uh, the last question I had was concerning uh, the retirement contributions. What is a $100 um, per month increase? What percentage is that for someone on, I mean, wh what were they paying last year? Is that in the comparison here? I, I don't have that. Uh, I can bring it back. Yeah. I, I know um, I, just thinking to the fixed income aspect of this and what what $100 a month uh, adds. I, I, just from the uh, figures that I recall, the spend that they had uh, was around $1,200 per month, and the, the premium that they were at was around um, 350 And so we had an incre increase last month, and I think it, this would bring them to about 600 Okay. But I can get the, um, you know, more specifics on that. We're still very low compared to the amount that um, their premium would be to actually cover the claims. Right. Uh, so is the ask today to then um, vote to approve the changes, um, perhaps excluding the emergency piece, if that's possible? From the board, okay. Excluding as well as the emergency. We're bringing it back to you. Okay. The emergency piece came from the I think Trustee Cole, Vice Chairman Cole, brought up the one about on campus. What was that? I, I walked out, but I, I like that idea. Uh, on site care, but that would be part of right. their three year strategy. Yeah, right. They're right. bringing it back anyway. I don't think yeah. that that's. I'll, I'll make a motion that we accept <laughs> those, those necessary changes to those recommendations from the board. Second. Any comments or questions? All those in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. Thank, Thank you, you both. You. Mr. Wechter. Good morning again, members of the board, Mr. Chairman, Dr. Williams. As discussed last month, we want to uh, provide frequent and uh, ongoing updates on the progress of the Student Success Building here at the St. Petersburg Gibbs campus, and that's my intent this morning. Um, today's a big day, a milestone day in the progress of the project. We have the groundbreaking immediately following this meeting. Um, Trustee Cole and Trustee Bellow, you, we talked last month about the uh, issue of bringing forth a steel package. Uh, we have committed from the uh, commitment from the design builder that we will be far enough along in the design of the structural steel and the foundation package that at the next meeting in October, we will have a package for you to approve, so that will keep them moving forward. Uh, just to give you a visualization of the, of the construction progress, last month you approved the site package. Those individual bids are being solicited right now. They'll be working on that for about three months that'll take them right about to the end of the year in october we'll bring you the foundation and the structural steel package that will allow us to get that structural steel ordered which as we mentioned before is a long lead item so we will the board's actions the design the costing and the board approval will actually be ahead of the construction schedule so while all that construction is going on we'll be designing and bringing to you approval so we'll be ahead of that game rather than than uh, following the construction. So that those things will be ready to deliver as soon as the construction phases allow it. Um, and that will allow us to uh, begin those foundations and steel work in January, February, as soon as they're finished with the underground infrastructure, which is what they're working on right now. This slide is very detailed, and I, I won't get into to all the specifics, but it's just a, a really broad overview of some of the activities that have gone on since the original appropriation was signed by the governor last summer, uh, summer of, of 16, that is, and then, of course, the second one this, this past summer. A um, lot of work went on related to uh, relocating uh, utilities out of the former administration building, getting temporary spaces made for those people, uh, getting the asbestos removed, getting those buildings demolished, all the while we were going through the process of selecting our design build firm for this project. So that gives you some details of some of the activities that have been going on to date. 
the visioning process, which is a cumbersome process because you have to include all the stakeholders. That's all behind us. The, uh, the uh, schematic design that you approved last month is a big, big significant event. So um, a lot of the, the slow moving parts I think are behind us with the advertising and the solicitations and all that kind of stuff, the selection of the contractor. Um, I, I think we're on a good course moving forward. So with that, I'll answer any questions that you may have. And we look forward to our groundbreaking. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Wechter. Thank you. Appreciate it. That brings us to the consent agenda today. Uh, I'd like to take all this in one piece, but first we'll see if any uh, of our board members have any questions or comments uh, with any piece of that consent agenda. Nothing from the board. So moved. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Consent agenda passes. We have no informational reports today. Um, president's report, Dr. Yes. Williams. Yes, yes, yes. Um, earlier this week, I sent um, an email to the board to follow up on Trustee Givens' recommendation on the naming for the St. Petersburg building that we're about to build, the Student um, Services Center. And um, I wanted to propose to the board that we follow up on Trustee Givens' recommendation by following the college's policy and in, in instituting the committee, which will, um, I think that the vice chair is a member of that committee and that we uh, get together and put together some members and follow the committee process and bring forward the name of the recommended candidate um, who has approved being named um, on that building. And so I wanted to get the board's approval to follow the college's protocol that you set forward. I move that we accept the, the uh, vice chair put a committee together along with the president mm -hmm. to move in the naming of the um, student services building here on the Gibbs campus. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? So moved. Good, and then the other thing I wanted to bring forward is that on Monday, the 25th, the Pinellas County um, Legislative Delegates will be at the Clearwater Campus, and I have an opportunity to welcome them, but also to uh, get about 15 minutes on their agenda to share with them the vision of the college and where we're going as they head into the legislative session. So um, I wanna thank Dr. Vitito, and um, I wanna thank Deborah for making that possible for me to have their captive attention. We're putting together a brochure to share with them the SPC story and what we're looking for and where we're going. I believe the committees will start meeting again in October in Tallahassee. I'm not sure what we're gonna get out of that and hopefully everyone uh, is okay and will be able to attend. But in October, I should be able to bring you some legislative updates as to where we are with the budget proposals um, by um, the education board as well as the Florida College system and what the Council of Presidents are planning to make their legislative asks to be as well. Um, and I'll be sharing this with my team so St. Pete College will know what we're looking forward to and where we're going. And that's my report for today. Thank you very much. Our, our next Board of Trustees meeting will be on October 17th at the beautiful Bay Pines STEM Center. Thank you all for being here today. Hopefully please, we'll, yep. Please, please, I just want to thank Fellow Bay College alumni alum, uh, my apologies, and I should have done this in my time. I was uh, not thinking that the meeting was that close. <laughs> um, but uh, thank you for the board's action and accountability for uh, your assistance and, and uh, continued cooperation with, uh, with this board and, uh, and all that you do for the college. Thank you thank for the board's action. Mm -hmm. uh, I would have been here. Um, I know. But at the time you were meeting, uh, I was uh, enjoying my first kidney. And it, um, I didn't uh, share I that. Much, <laughs> I would much rather have been here. Exactly. Um, but all is well, and thank you. Uh, nice meeting, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you for your uh, leadership on this board. And that's all I have. Thank Mr. You, Foster, Mr. Foster, I do want to thank you for your leadership and the time that you were the chair of the board. and. I know I called you when I first started several times and you're very supportive, so thank you for that. Appreciate it. Thank you. 
We will um, adjourn the meeting now and hopefully see most of you downstairs for the uh, groundbreaking ceremony at <laughs> 1130. Thank you. <laughs>